Welcome to Smart Talk, where we speak with leading academics and other thoughtful persons on the important challenges facing the world today. My name is Edward Dodson. I am a longtime member of the faculty of the Henry George School of Social Science. For this episode of Smart Talk, we have the pleasure of talking with Chris England, adjunct lecturer in the Department of History at Georgetown University. His new book, Land and Liberty, Henry George and the Crafting of Modern Liberalism, has recently been published by John Hopkins University Press. I've had the pleasure of reading the book recently and found it uh, amazing. Uh, so we're here to talk with Chris about the book, about his interest in Henry George as a historical figure and his role in the period of time that he covered in this book. And so, Chris, uh, I guess I'll, I'll open up our discussion with just asking you, when did you first become interested in the period and in Henry George's role as part of that progressive era? Well, um, I, I've long been interested in the period because it is such a pivotal moment in the development of American institutions, both political and economic. Um, Henry George, uh, you know, came a little bit out of the blue for me. He was not someone who I, as a historian, had encountered um, substantially um, throughout much of my education. And when I did find him in um, the works of uh, the preamble to the Knights of Labor, which was the leading labor organization of the time, I sort of asked myself, who is this guy and why is he here? And what, why is this uh, tax thing something that uh, workers are so interested in? So I came into this subject through a lens of sort of pure science, uh, trying to answer a question as to where this, where this idea came from and what it means um, and why people were drawn to it. Uh, and you know, much of the historical literature, I think had a relatively dismissive view of Henry George um, um, and you know, often tended, was inclined to see him as you know, a holdover of, various old ideas dating back to Thomas Jefferson about you know, the, the primacy of agriculture and all these things. So I, I came in without necessarily um, a positive viewpoint, um, just a sense that this, the movement was a little bit baffling to me. But as time came, uh, as you know, my research developed, I found it to be a very different sort of movement than what uh, people had projected. I found its orientation to be very urban, um, it, I found it to be kind of rooted in kind of a, uh, a substantial uh, body of ideas related to you know, the history of liberalism. Um, and I found it to be importantly responding to you know, really important economic issues related to rising urban rents, uh, the power of railroads and telegraphs and how those were spatially located. Um, uh, and um, uh, and I found it to be sort of in, you know, representative of issues that are still with us today in terms of the importance of uh, rents and the distribution of wealth um, and sort of the localization of value in urban areas in ways that create certain types of uh, monopolistic practices. I guess the next question I have is your focus on liberalism. It's been my sense that the liberalism that arose in the United States was quite different than the liberalism that we uh, semi-inherited from the British um, in terms of the emphasis on free trade and individualism. It seems to me that what happens in, in the United States is liberalism becomes a sort of a compromise position between the left and right. Is that a fair assessment in your view? Yeah, the, the, that that is um, partially uh, true. Um, my approach to uh, liberalism and um, to political ideology in general is rooted in the ideas of Michael Frieden, a British political theorist who thinks about ideologies not as sort of um, static, you know, platonic ideas that you could, you know, define independently of um, any sort of historical context, but it's traditions that evolve over time in response to circumstances. Uh, and so there are certain kind of key uh, values that I think, you know, more or less define liberalism, though their relative importance over time shifts. 
Uh, but, you know, liberals do, broadly speaking, believe in um, individual rights. Uh, they do believe in uh, the market, though sometimes that their faith in the market is circumscribed by certain types of limitations. Uh, they believe in democracy. Um, and, you know, in following the history of Henry George, I, I, I do look at him as kind of a transitional figure in terms of uh, he popularizes the notion of social value, that um, communities have rights to property rooted in the fact that communities create value in land, which is the uh, representation of the community in general. And so in, in making this argument, he does sort of um, recontextualize liberalism in a, in a way that um, builds off of liberal ideas of the right to own what you make, but also create the space for broader social claims to, to wealth. Um, and you know, I, I look at him as a transitional figure in that process. The New Deal in some ways takes these ideas and goes in a different direction. Uh, but there are always some ways in which the New Deal, New Deal, New Deal sort of builds off of these ideas in terms of particular focus on land and natural resources and programs like the Tennessee Valley Authority um, that sought to socialize the values of uh, hydroelectric power. Um, the resettlement administration that created um, community or government owned towns. Um, so um, the New Deal, I look as not always a departure from George's ideas, but something that inherited elements of it. Well, you do know, I mean, that uh, Raymond Moley, for example, although he was not a Georgist, he was certainly familiar with Henry George's analysis when he was part of Roosevelt's brain trust. And I, and I found it interesting, and maybe, maybe you can shed some light on this, that um, he doesn't seem to have ever mentioned anything about land reform during the period of time where he was involved with the first part of the New Deal. Uh, nothing that I can find in any of his writings when he had Roosevelt's attention. Uh, yeah. Do you have uh, any any sense of what, you know, why that might have been or that it, it never really was a big part of the New Deal, not from, from Rexford Tugwell or from you know, any of those who were, who were involved in the New Deal on the Democratic Party side? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Rexford Tugwell, who Raymond Moley brings into uh, the New Deal is, you know, very influential in promoting kind of government owned towns, um, which, you know, in some ways build off of Georgia's ideas of socializing land, though, of course, they're, you know, they depart from uh, the emphasis on taxation. Uh, Moley, you know, doesn't talk about land reform, I think, uh, at all, really, um, during his time in the New Deal, though after he leaves the New Deal, he does go and, you know, he gives speeches to Georgists and he talks about, right. you know, the, the importance of Georgia's ideas. And I think in this sense, you know, he embodies the perspective of uh, many uh, Georgists in the early um, days of the New Deal. Um, you know, he's, he's uh, by no means orthodox, and I don't know that he really even has a full grasp of Henry George. But uh, do you think it has with, anything to do with the fact that in the credentialed environment, the those those individuals who were academics uh, who had their credentials felt a little bit uh, out of sync with the rest of what was happening in academia, and so were intimidated in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are always ways in which. Um, you know, Georgism is um, sometimes at odds with um, academia in terms of the fact that, you know, it is an ideology, right? Um, it has, um, you know, a firmly fixed belief system and academics generally, um, well, not always, but, you know, often like to be value neutral. So someone like John Commons, for example, is, you know, John Commons often talks about land value taxation. Uh, he speaks approvingly of Georgists, but there's a sense in which he's clearly, you know, on the outside of the movement. Uh, and people like George Krill, who work with him occasionally, see him as, as a little bit suspicious <laughs> because, you know, he doesn't quite share 
uh, all of the commitments um, of that a, um, um, a you know of a devoted Georgist. But you know, in terms of Moli and the time period, I think in general there's a sense that um, a lot of people are trying to go along with the New Deal because there's a crisis situation and they're trying to adapt. Um, and you know, this is a moment in which Georgia's ideals are sort of at, at a at a at a nadir. They're at, they're at a low point, um, and so people are trying to be active in the ways that they can and fix immediate issues in the way that they can. Uh, but then, as the New Deal progresses, and I think many of these Georgias feel like it's going astray from their ideas, then they begin to revert to a much more orthodox position and say. Uh, there's something there's something that we don't like about this and you see this for example in um samuel seabury uh, who's a um you know a, um a leading person in the um in the you know new york city new, new york um, state politics really um, he was a judge if i remember correctly he was a judge and he was also instrumental in bringing down um well at least seriously impairing the democratic party machine family well, I have, I have, let me let me ask you uh, one question. Then I want to take you back to Henry George's period and and the rise of the movement that he started and some of the factors that led to its peak. But then it's very uh, the attrition that occurred. But the first mm -hmm. question I have is: it, Do you think it, your book is timely in a sense that there is a renewed level of interest? and what Henry George and reformers like Henry George had to offer society that is not currently being offered by the current uh, intellectual and political uh, leadership? Yeah, I, I, I do think so. Um, you know, um, George looked um, to land as something that was important. Uh, and, um, you know, he was part of a major tradition of thinkers who did that, uh, that sort of evaporated, right? Um, after the New Deal, when you have suburbanization and uh, people cease to think of real estate as an axis of inequality. Um, in, in more recent uh, years, it has reemerged as an important axis of inequality. And I think, frankly, most of the ideas around what it means and how to address it are, are not very well developed. <laughs> uh, you know, th th there's a disconnect there in terms of people have lost track of traditional ways of thinking about this, um, and um, you know, the, the ideas are often not very substantive. Um, you know, I think, you know, for example, you have arguments for dezoning, which I think are, you know, partially valid, but. Um, you know, the idea that um, ha an unregulated housing market is going to be a, you know, a cheap one is, you know, belied by places like Tokyo, right, which does have an unregulated housing market, and is clearly not, <laughs> you know, uh, hardly a place in which space is ample and affordable. I don't know um, if it still is, but I, I recall that Houston, Texas was one of the major cities in the United States that had no zoning requirements or and no, no real uh, planning for land use. And, and Texas real estate values have been skyrocketing. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there are also, you know, on the left, you have ideas about um, the, the right to the city or rights to housing, which in some ways, um, you know, George does embrace in the collective sense that we all, you know, have a, a stake in the land and in the city. Um, but, you know, um, the, the idea that we have an individual claimant upon land and natural resources is precisely the sort of idea that perpetuated the homestead system where everyone went out, grabbed land, and destroyed natural resources. Um, as Proudhon said, uh, property is theft. Yes. Uh, land is, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's exclusive. And if one person has land, that means another person doesn't. Um, and um, seeing land as a, 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 an unlimited resource that we can just uh, dispense with freely is, you know, setting, um, you know, setting people up for, you know, conflict for dispossession in terms of ultimately it means taking your land away from some people, giving it to others, and also, you know, to natural resources also. Um, 
you know, the Georgist approach is more informed because it represents the idea that land is finite and um, the, our access to it should be, you know, based off of our willingness to, you know, to pay for it. <laughs> well, uh, certainly, and, certainly and that is the value of it to us rather than others. Yeah. That's the message that the Henry George School uh, of Social Science has been trying to deliver to the general public since it was founded back in 1932. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, and it's it's amazing to me. Uh, uh, over the years of my teaching, I have probably had in the classroom maybe a couple thousand people. And yet the this very idea that you've just described of the earth being a commons that belongs to us all, um, it's really hard to get people to embrace that. And, and mm -hmm. perhaps it's because we've become so uh, enamored by wealth building through home ownership. That, mm -hmm. that, I think, is probably one of the challenges that we have as a society to move toward uh, the vision that Henry George offered us, that that. If you look at the net worth of households in the United States, much of that net worth is made up of the equity that they have in their residential property. And most of that equity would be coming from land value. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which you know creates an economic system which fosters speculation because there is a substantial amount of wealth that's tied up in kind of, um, you know, not hard values of materials, but sort of the speculative demand for land. Uh, and that is propped up through, you know, banking, um, which, um, uh, which reaps its profits through the financialization of land. Um, and those rising land values make it more and more difficult for um, productive industries to, you know, compete in a global market in which there is, are other places with cheaper land um, and um, where cheaper land allows for cheaper labor. Uh, and so what you, you end up developing in an economy that pumps money into individual home ownership is, you know, kind of a, a fake economy that we have today, right? You know, an economy that is based off of the expectation that, our, um, that our land will mean something, uh, but not any sort of, um, but not so much on kind of productive capacity or economic development. And as, as, as economists that are, have, have studied Henry George's theory of business uh, and economic cycles have embraced, it seems, more than ever, people like Joseph Stiglitz, it, this the land markets, the property markets are a key driver in these economic cycles of boom and bust. And if we don't tame the land markets, then we're going to continue to experience these cycles, regardless of what government policy, what other government policies might be, you know, put into play. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, um, the Great uh, Recession was caused by you know a real estate bust. Um, and, you know, rising financial investment in land was a function of rising values of land. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, the fact that people can't afford housing and they're taking out more loans than they can afford to try to find a place to live, uh, you know, creates a speculative economy that will ultimately bust as you, you just, you know, pump more and more money into the land market, hoping people can afford it. But really, what you're doing is driving up the price of housing, and you're also agree, creating. 100%. A, you're you're also creating an economy that is um, less open to uh, social mobility, right? Um, if uh, you keep land cheap, then it's easier for people to step into that to to acquire land, to acquire resources, to either have a house or to. Um, or to um, um, uh, or to you know start a business, but if you are propping up high real estate values, what you're doing is you're saying that you, you know your fate in life is often going to be tied up it, with uh, you know whether or not your parents invested wisely in <laughs> in, in, in their housing choice, uh, and if if they didn't, then the obstacles to entering into um, the housing market, which by which I mean just having a place to to sleep, <laughs> are 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 uh, quite narrow. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you know my background at all, Chris, but I spent all my entire working life in the financial services sector. I managed the residential mortgage lending program for a commercial bank and then spent my last 20 years before retiring at Fannie Mae on affordable housing initiatives. So everything you're talking about is is what I lived with on a day-to-day -day basis in the trenches. And uh, I did my best to get the people in in the affordable housing community to understand that this was a that the land market was a major obstacle for everything that we were trying to accomplish. And it wasn't easy because people have their their expertise that they've they've earned through through long years of formal study and then on the ground work. And um, the solution that that most of the people in the in the affordable housing sector uh, embrace is some sort of subsidy. You know, it's got to be there's construction has to be subsidized. Uh, household incomes have to be subsidized. Um, and everyone is is very, um, I guess, um, ill prepared for the kind of systemic reform that Henry George offered and that you've you've detailed in the book that you you've written. And so I'd, I'd like to take you back to the movement that George started. And you, you know, you highlight the fact that his his fame, his reputation, his impact really uh, was catapulted when he went to Ireland, when he first met um, um, uh, David, Michael David, and went to Ireland. And I, would you expand a little bit on that for readers? Because they, I think a lot of people weren't familiar with that period in George's life. Yeah. So, um, you know, at the time, uh, you know, I mean, England has been, or sorry, Ireland has been through a series of um, economic crises, most notably the famine. Um, and a lot of this has to do with um, the fact that the Irish are living uh, often as tenants and usually on sort of micro plots of land that are too small to really sustain themselves. Um, and so uh, a lot of Irish nationalists like Michael Davitt see uh, the question of land as intimately intertwined with the question of uh, colonialism, uh, because the English have uh, taken over Ireland, they've assumed control of the land, they are, um, you know, collecting rents. Uh, and, uh, and so from a very, you know, from the beginning of his movement, um, his first sort of major sort of propulsion to fame is that he connects the question of land to the question of colonialism and economic exploitation um, around sort of tenants. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, he becomes intertwined in questions of um, nationalism. You know, George always believes that um, the tendency is towards, um, um, towards internationalism, that we're, there's going to be a move towards growing sort of uh, international institutions. Um, and I think possibly because he is a free trader and he sees, um, you know, the flow of goods and people of free trade tending towards a less, um, you know, insulated world. Um, but at the same time, he, he supports the nation in terms of, um, you know, a, a place for kind of exercise of democratic power. Um, and Georgets will, you know, be brought into, you know, World War I, where they side with uh, Wilson in the hope of, you know, uh, liberating small and subject peoples and um, creating nations that are uh, more democratic and that they're free from imperial control. Um, in part, they see this as a, you know, a path towards um, their goal of uh, land nationalization because they think that if you know, the common people are in charge, uh, they will be more likely to implement these economic reforms. Well, you, write, the same hmm? you, you write that that when George first came to Ireland uh, with Michael Davitt, and I mean, he, and and championed land nationalization, that there was a really huge positive reception. But eventually, the Davit lost his influence to Parnell, and I wonder, you know, how do you think the, the Irish population that was so uh, oppressed by absentee landlordism, uh, you know, from from the British, 
how could they identify with Parnell, who was a major landowner himself? That seemed to that's always seemed to me to be rather. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's the same way that you know we in the United States identify politically with people we shouldn't have if our our best interests are at heart. So I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts the, on that? The, um, that's a good question, and um, you know I'm I'm, a, I'm an American historian. I I don't have an, an intimate enough knowledge of you know the full um, tapestry of Irish history to say that for sure. Uh, but, you know, uh, Parnell is considered a charismatic figure. And I do think that, you know, often when you have nationalist movements, they come to be kind of, they, they, they rarely um, fail to embrace some sort of kind of, you know, ethnic um, identity. Um, and oftentimes nationalist movements develop an affinity for um kind of wealthier, powerful people who seem to embody um, kind of the best elements of their culture. And so there's a tendency to rally around sometimes strong men, right? Or, or people who uh, will um, kind of present the culture in a positive light. And so, you know, it's very often the case that nationalist movements that begin with ideas of equality and democracy kind of get um, derailed <laughs> um, by, by, more or less, by, by more or less ethnic ideals and kind of ideals of ethnic affinity. Well, it, um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm gonna, I thought, I know I'm taking you all over uh, okay. because you've covered so much territory in the book mm -hmm. and there are just parts of the story that um, are, I think, really intriguing and interesting as the, as George's movement expanded and then declined and they abandoned the goal of land nationalization and began to adopt strategies for um, either land value taxation or other kinds of reforms and uh, it seems to me that that there's a criticism that that could be lodged against those individuals who came after George but did George himself, begin to believe that the, that land nationalization was impossible and that that he needed to change his strategy to take what was possible yeah um so uh that's a good question and i you know i think that um i i don't think um any of these individuals would say that they saw land nationalization is impossible or that they gave it up, but that they were focusing on incrementalism, right? That they were uh, taking on one goal at a time uh, with the idea that some of these reforms would eventually facilitate the single tax. A great example is that Georgia's become actively involved in the fight for direct legislation, a referendum. Mm -hmm. um, and they do this because they. I think that if the people can vote for the issue, it'll be more likely to pass than if they have to go through a legislature. Um, and uh, more uh, additionally, um, most states have constitutional uh, bans on any kind of uh, taxation that wouldn't be uniform across different classes of property. And the referendum uh, system creates an immediate constitutional amendment that bypasses it right away. Um, so, these were not people who gave up on the single tax. These were people who um, who were fighting about it, fighting for it around with all of these tangential methods. And I think because of that, built momentum around a movement that otherwise uh, had, you know, sometimes stalled uh, and kept the movement going by integrating all these other issues that were seen as intimately connected with uh, the question of uh, of land value taxation, either as a direct route to it or as a uh, something that was you know, consistent with their broader values. But there were, always people, there were always people who criticized that, who thought that um, Georgists were uh, too incremental, that they didn't, that they shied away from expressing their beliefs directly, um, that they should be fighting for the end goal, not to our steps along the way. Um, George himself, I think, believed in incrementalism. 
you know, uh, in, in his final days, he rallies around William Jennings Bryant, even though Bryant right. doesn't really kind of share any of his particular political beliefs because he's trying to get the movement into the Democratic Party. Yeah, uh, I, I think getting, uh, Louis Post described, you know, uh, William Jennings Bryant as part of the the new Democrat uh, group. And, and I know in the public uh, for, for many years, Post covered William Jennings Bryan's uh, every move, every activity. Um, and uh, I think, you know, Post is probably one of the architects of the strategy that you've been, you know, talking about. Uh, would, certainly he, his coverage of anti-imperialism in the public is extensive and, uh, you know, uh, race relations. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is, this is a source of, of information that, that both um, people knowledgeable of Henry George and the movement need to pay attention to, but also historians, I think, should take a look at the public uh, during its years of publication. It's a wealth of insight into the you know, mentality of, of not just Georgists, but people who were concerned about you know, social and economic reform generally. Yeah. In a lot of ways, uh, uh, post the public is, you know, an alternative history of the era. And that, you know, I mean, it, it just it, one of his headlines, his taglines is, a, you know, narrative of um, history in the making or something like that. Uh, and it is chronicling events of the era, era from a Georgia's perspective that, you know, is not represented in um, a, the way that a lot of historians or, you know, certainly the common person. Sees the uh, sees the period. Um, there is, for example, you know, a a fear and animosity of Theodore Roosevelt that I think would would shock many people who see Roosevelt as kind of this um, kind of this, this great man in American history. Um, and you know, in, in a lot of ways, you know, my function in this book isn't always to you know lay out that perspective. Uh, the the public was a a major source of mine and you know to contextualize it and the other things we know about the um about the period and to sort of build off of it with a lot of private correspondence that shows you know connections and uh and kind of behind the scenes plots that aren't part of the the you know public profile of the the movement um and you know it's it was a, I think, a startlingly politically astute movement. Um, you know, you, you see this in the correspondence that they're thinking very, um, you know, um, very critically about where they can fit into politics, about, you know, how they present their views in a way that is, um, you know, is going to have the maximum impact. Um, uh, I think we tend to see reformers as idealists who are just going to go out there and say whatever they think. But what we see here is actually people who are, um, you know, are quite intelligent in how they, um, how they kind of manage political operations. And you, you know, you detail the, the, the debate within the movement between establishing an independent political party, a, mm -hmm. an independent political movement and whether or not they should ally themselves with, uh, you know, the standard parties, and they end up basically most of them up until probably what the the nineteen thirties when the, sort of the splintering occurs that they're mostly aligned with the Democratic Party. Yeah, uh, yeah. There there are some holdovers with the Republican Party. I think maybe, uh, you know. Uh, some people who I think are drawn to Roosevelt because of his conservationist policies, um, but most end up going to the Democratic Party, I think, because of their free trade policies, because, you know, Brian has sort of been allied with the um, Democratic Party with the common man, uh, and Brian has built a particularly strong alliance with um, Post, uh, the editor yeah. of the public, and, you know, they are, you know, privately friends, they communicate, they, they send letters, they you know, they meet up at Tom Johnson's house and they debate. Uh, and, you know, when uh, Brian leaves the Wilson administration, he asked Post to present his ideas to Wilson. 
um, and you know, serve as an intermediary. So you know, they, they are really close political associates in the sense that um, that you know there's an alliance here with the leader of the Democratic Party is I think something that draws a lot of people into um, the Democratic Party as something that can uh, is potentially a vehicle uh, for their movement. And you know they they do uh, in the Wilson administration secure very high political positions that do allow them to have some of the impacts that they wanted to see. Um, you know, but then again, you know there, there are also plenty of issues with the Wilson administration, and so uh, you know that's, who besides you know, those are the bargains. <laughs> that, that who besides Post and Newton Baker uh, held held. Uh, you know, very, very senior positions in the Milson administration. Those are the only two I can re remember, but. Well, you know, Frederick Howe is, Frederick Howe. Uh, it, you know, he's in uh, the Commission of Immigration. Right, right. Uh, and also, Nellis Island. Yeah. Um, Lane, Fra Lane um, Franklin Lane uh, is in charge of the Interior Department, uh, and he is uh, allied with the movement. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if he's Orthodox, but he is definitely someone who the movement talks about in terms of people who they're going to reach out to in the um, um, in the administration. He was also a personal friend of Henry Jr. Uh, and he is the person who leads efforts to um, um, to begin a transition of the public domain to a leasehold system we have nowadays. Um, and then, you know, George Prill, who's in charge of propaganda during war. Um, and, um, you know, uh, is, you know, sometimes seen as you know, pushing um, World War II, World War I ideology in a more progressive direction in terms of emphasizing that, you know, women's rights and uh, labor rights are part of the democracy that the United States should be fighting for. Uh, and, yeah. yeah. Well, what about the impact of the movement on organized religion? You you talk about uh, Henry George's religious beliefs as uh, sort of uh, not attached to any specific religious sect, but in particular, his reaction when he finished Progress and Poverty was that he had completed, you know, some sort of a of a a, a destiny you know, from a, from a spiritual religious standpoint. And I, you know, in studying the history of the movement as I have, it's amazing to me how many um, uh, religious leaders, clerics, priests, ministers, rabbis rallied around George's uh, writing. Uh, you know, Herbert Bigelow would be one. And of course, uh, Father McGlynn. Uh, but it, I can't find any evidence that their preaching affected their their uh, their flock. In other words, it seems like they were powerful religious leaders, but that the fact that they embraced George's vision didn't seem to to manifest itself throughout the the, the flock of religious believers. Yeah. You know that that's uh, you know that's hard to assess because you know oftentimes it's hard to reconstruct how the average person feels about things. You know we we have the people who leave documents, um, and by and large this history is a history of um, you know leaders of the movement and their mm -hmm. ideas and how they position themselves in politics. It's very hard to tell how the average person felt about these things except for perhaps through the ways that, that people are framing the issues and ways they think that uh, the average person is going to respond. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I do think that there, there is an impact, you know, it's somewhat Herbert Bigelow, he has his, um, um, he has his sermons um, serialized. So they're published right. in newspapers around the country. And so I can't imagine uh, people would be paying for them in their newspapers if there wasn't some impact. Um, and, you know, in ter I think there's a, a very clear impact in terms of, um, um, you know, Jewish um, uh, rabbi Stephen Weiss, a leader in um, uh, a leading figure in re American Reform Judaism, is a, a supporter of Henry George. 
And what you see is that the American Zionist organization does endorse land value taxation. They send it to, uh, to Europe where it's also endorsed. And you know, in Israel today, they have land value taxation. They have um, the second basic law, I think, of Israel declares land common property. Um, you know, I, I don't know if they realize George's ideas exactly, but there, there's a there's a clear lineage there, I think. Uh, and there are you know there are other things that contribute to that, but I think there's definitely a sense that um, um, George has had an outsized impact on on um, um, Jewish economic thought. And, and, you know, in terms of, you know, Christian thought, um, you know, the, there is some intimation that maybe the, the, the term social gospel uh, was meant to refer to progress and poverty. Social gospel being the idea that Christianity should um, try to reform social life and promote economic equality. And, um, you know, not all social gospel was, you know, explicitly or um, persistently affiliated with uh, George's ideas. But I think that there is a, a clear um, way of seeing him as having an impact on Christianity and promoting this transition towards social gospel. Uh, you know, prior to George, there were plenty of, um, of American religious reformers, but there was often a tendency to imagine that reform would happen when you converted people, um, that individuals made social change. So William Lloyd Garrison, the abolitionist, this mm -hmm. was his idea. He had, he had no mm -hmm. intention of fighting a war to abolish slavery. He wanted to persuade people that slavery was bad until eventually they decided to give it up. George reverses that in Progress and Poverty. He talks about the way in which economic institutions, um, you know, create vice and you know and make um, religious uh, salvation more difficult. And so George kind of inverts this logic and says that society makes religious faith rather than the other way around. And it's this idea which um, becomes pivotal to the development of uh, social gospel, which is a, you know, uh, a movement that is hugely important in promoting economic reform in um, early 20th century, mid 20th, 20th century um, America. Let me ask you about Joseph Fells mm -hmm. and his um, involvement in the, the movement. And Fells, uh, is interesting to me because he seems to have a very broad kind of uh, agenda. I mean, he, he supports the Zionist movement, and he also supports the creation of these utopian communities, such as Fairhope in Alabama and and uh, some others uh, in the in in England. I I think he funded some. In, uh, farms for people who are unemployed to come live on, et cetera. Um, how, how important was Joseph Fells and the funding he provided to keep the movement going during the first decade or two decades of the 20th century? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think the movement had, um, you know, it was it was still making pace, you know, before Joseph Fels, Fels came along, uh, Tom Johnson as mayor of Cleveland had become, made himself kind of the focal point of uh, American urban policy, right? He's the one everyone who is, everyone is looking for in terms of what radical politics in the city might look like. And he is promoting Georgia's ideas and Georgia's models for uh, American cities. Uh, but you know he loses his election. Um, uh, he he, he dies shortly thereafter, um, and then Joseph Fells comes along and in some ways fills the vacuum. It's hard to say what would have happened uh, had he not, uh, because there still were were movements occurring, you know, throughout the country. Um, but he does, you know, donate so a substantial sum of money to founding the Fells Fund, which then moves on to trying to establish land value taxation in states throughout the country. 
um, you know, and, and looking at his legacy, um, it's, it's mixed. You know, he, he does, um, there is an enormous amount of propaganda set out to um, you know, every citizen of certain states, right, um, about land value taxation. So certainly no one is ignorant of it uh, during uh, this period. Um, um, some of some of his particular fights seem to be, um, you know, a little bit. Um, yeah, I think do the do this uh, movement uh, kind of a disservice in that they try to push too far too fast, um, or um, you know, so for example, in Oregon, you had you know progressive movement towards uh, land value taxation, and there were you know. Um, there was a fight to establish, um, you know, the right for municipalities to um, to establish land value taxation, and that was bright, widely popular. But then, you know, there was a, a push to immediately establish land value taxation, and there, were, there was pushback in part because the the bill was had many flaws. Um, there were ways to kind of um, get around uh, the progressivity of it. Um, that might make it um, kind of inegalitarian. In California, too, there had been progressive um, steam built towards the development of, um, uh, of land value taxation. And then when the Fellows Fund stepped in, they, they pushed for a more radical great adventure movement, uh, and there was a backlash right. to that. Yeah, you might um, tell tell our listeners a little bit about the Great Adventure movement. I mean, I my understanding and reading of it is that they got very close through an INR uh, effort to getting a constitutional amendment for the single tax pass, at least at one point. Yeah. So the the um, kind of the more established Georgias of uh, California had been pushing for. A local option system that would have allowed municipalities to determine the question for themselves, um, and uh, it was widely believed that if this were passed, um, uh, San Francisco would go immediately towards land value taxation, and the votes were quite close. Um, but then, um, you know, there was there was some impatience, and uh, the um, the Great Adventure movement was composed of. Uh, you know, lesser known people who weren't really, who hadn't been part of George's associates, who uh, weren't really very well integrated into the movement, but promised to sort of pass the single tax immediately. Um, and uh, they managed to kind of capture the support of the Fellows Fund. Um, and after, you know, after the referendum, the questions were changed to the great uh, adventures policy. There was a, there was a big, uh, pushback and the 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 referendum campaign started to lose votes for each year. Um, so the, the there there was there was sort of progress around uh, a, a movement that would have um, kind of empowered municipalities, and this is this is the system that uh, ultimately succeeds in uh, British Columbia, right? In British Columbia. Uh, uh, British Columbia passes a law that allows municipalities to set their own rates. Um, and then, you know, um, Vancouver um, eliminates all of the taxes on improvements and places all of the real estate um, um, taxes on land, all the property taxes on land. And um, you see a big movement around British Columbia in that direction afterwards, because Vancouver is seen as booming in response to uh, this change. And um, I think there's, there, there's a sense that municipalities are kind of competing amongst each other, that you know, this is a period of rapid growth and change in the area. Um, and all of them feel as if they need to kind of outdo each other on this position to maintain their kind of competitive position. So that, that, that focus on empowering municipalities, I think was quite effective in, uh, in spreading the system. And you know, that's, that's what's happened in Pennsylvania too, right? In a lot of respects that- you know, you yeah, started, It fits and starts. <laughs> yeah, it fits and starts. But uh, yeah, you, you started with two cities and then it spread um, 
to various other cities throughout the, uh, the state. And um, I think now in other states too, right? Other neighboring states. Um, I, I, the, the, sad, the sad part of the story that you've just told us is that uh, in the Canadian cities, eventually they abandon the two-rate approach. I, I, I've i never really been able to find out exactly when that occurred and what were the political circumstances. Was it during the Depression when land values were, were significantly uh, you know, falling? Uh, or was it because there was a uh, either a, an ultra conservative government brought into those cities or or even maybe a socialist uh, government on the left? Do you have any insight into th what happened? Yeah, I, I've actually published an article about this. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the split rate system um, lingers on to various degrees um, until the early 80s. Uh, but th there's there's gradual pushback that um, tends to slowly equalize rates between land and um, and realist and improvements. And you know one of the big um, big moments is sort of the Great Depression, um, and also in the 1920s when real estate values begin to drop. Um, and so there's um, there's pushback against that. There, there's, you know, progressively higher taxation on land um, uh, that has alienated some people. But, you know, I think that, you know, in the article, I argue that land value taxation has, you know, done what it intended to do uh, in British Columbia in terms of even its critics say that it has decreased um, the price of real estate. Has created a renter's market where it's easy to find housing. Um, you know, some people say that you know there's more housing than there needs to be, right? Uh, it's you know created easier access to property. Uh, it's done all the things that it, it was meant to do, but once it's done those things, I think maybe people um, say, well, now I have my house. Can can it increase in value? <laughs> I, I don't want to pay taxes on it anymore. And I think you know this is you know uh, you know problem with any sort of social policy is that sometimes when it's effective, um, you know, um, the, the need for it seems to appear and people no longer uh, recognize the ways in which it, it could be relevant or important for the long term. Um, yeah, public education is certainly, you know, critical. And, and George seemed to understand that, um, that in, what did he say? Until there is right thought, there cannot be right action. Yeah. And I, I mean, we had the experience, for example, in Pittsburgh, where in 2000, the county reassessed all the property in the county, including the city, and it caused such a uh, an uproar because they hadn't kept assessments current for decades. And so people obviously, you know, were were seriously affected by by the reassessments. And so. I think uh, from an activist standpoint within the Georges community, there has been a, uh, a fairly strong emphasis on getting assessments right and getting communities to do assessments regularly and keeping them current. And, and uh, even the, the experience of, of Ted Gortney, who was the assessor in Greenwich, Connecticut, basically he said, we didn't have land value taxation as a two-rate property tax, but just by keeping assessments up to date, 70%, approx I think he said 70% of the assessed value in Greenwich, Connecticut was in land. And so I can imagine. <laughs> so, and, and for many communities, getting assessments right brings you almost to an effective uh, two-rate you know, property tax structure. Yeah. And you know th this is one of the one of the ironies that you know comes through in parts of the book is that sometimes the you know despite reticence around kind of um, you know technocracy and government by experts, uh, often the system was sort of better realized through assessors and you know uh, tax experts who sometimes you know probably just uniformly establish the system <laughs> even if it wasn't um you know um legally uh 
you know, if it hadn't been passed um, um, through the legislature. Um, and th there was in the early 20th century, a very active period of assessor activism um, in which, you know, um, Georgia's held assessor positions and influenced the taxation process in a variety of ways that was perceived as uh, tending towards land value taxation, either through more accurate assessments or um, through better um, um, you know, it, it's, it's honestly hard to say uh, whether or not sometimes the previous assessors just hadn't thought about land, right, in, when they valued things, and sometimes that seems to be the case, or uh, whether the assessors were just going out of their way to place, you know, heavier burdens on land. But one way or the other, they tended to shift the value of taxation onto the, the value of that site rather than onto the, the, you know, the the property bill on it. Well, you've provided readers, uh, myself included, with their re remarkable insights into the history of the Georgia's community and the Georgia's movement, and some insight into what we can look forward to uh, as you know the message that Henry George offered and his followers offered starts to resonate with a public that begins to see. Uh, the problem of land speculation and land monopoly more than ever before. And I think that's, for me, that is the hope that your book finds a large readership and that right. it will act as a, um, as a invitation for people to learn a lot more about what these ideas have to offer us in our communities. And, um, and so I, I certainly can. I congratulate you on a on a wonderful book, one that I've certainly enjoyed. And I want to I want to ask you now to sort of speak to potential readers, and 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 answer the question: If I buy your book, I read your book, what are what are the main messages that you are going to give to me? What am I going to take away from this book, from your perspective? You know, I, I want people to understand um, the, uh, you know, the ideas of Henry George uh, and his impact, you know, to understand the philosophy, to understand some of the things that came out of that philosophy. Um, you know, George has stated his philosophy, but I want people to understand what it looks like in practice when people had power and had influence and um, determine sort of the details, you know, fleshed out precisely what this would mean uh, when they were in power. And, you know, to a little bit more broadly, to think about how change happens in democracy and, you know, how you affect change. Uh, there are questions here about expertise and popular politics, about the way in which social movements organize um, and the, the extent to which they, you know, focus on incrementalism or focus on immediate change. And, you know, sometimes the answers aren't there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. I'm not sure anyone has those, but uh, but the problems are there, and the evidence is there for people to think through those uh, questions uh, as they they see fit. Well, on the jacket of your book, uh, I, there are some some very positive comments from from uh, a number of prominent uh, historians, and I wonder if uh, the book has resulted in invitations to speak more about this subject at uh, upcoming historic conferences of historians? Uh, so I've, I've done a lot of podcasts uh, so far. Uh, I haven't been invited to any big talks, but but we'll, we'll see how things uh, things go. It's, you know. Well, hopefully this, uh, this, this, this conversation that we've had for the Henry George School will help promote the book and, and maybe attract some additional attention uh, because it's so, certainly uh, in my view, uh, worthy of a good deal of attention. So, Chris, I thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk with me and to join us for this edition of Smart Talk. And so I'll end it by saying that's that's it for this edition of Smart Talk. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. And again, I'm Edward Dodson. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.